preach today from this subject, the glorious light of God's truth. The glorious light of God's truth. As unto a light that shineth in a dark place till the sun comes up and lights up the place. So once the sun comes up, you won't need a light. Because the sun will illuminate everything. But until then, you need a light. A flashlight or some type of light to see in that dark place. Till the sun comes up. So you are to take heed to the gospel. As it is a light. Like it is a light that shineth in a dark room, in a dark cave, in a dark crevice, in something dark until the sun comes up. Then you're able to see the glorious light of God's truth. Father, bless us now as we preach the word of the Lord. May we preach it with power and authority in Jesus' name. May we do no damage to your word but preach that which becometh sound doctrine and gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. As unto a light that shineth in a dark place. If it wouldn't hurt the production and brethren don't do it, I'd have you to turn all the lights off and then turn them back on. Don't do it. <laughs> but as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Allow me to begin this message by saying this. And, and uh, but let me say something else before I say what I was about to say. The glorious light of God's truth that I'm speaking of is the Bible. The Bible, that book that you have right there in your lap or on whatever. Hopefully you brought your Bibles to church, but if you, um, however you have the word of the Lord, the Bible is the light. God's glorious light that shines in this dark world. I want to say this. The Bible simplifies life. That's why the devil don't want you to read it. And he most certainly don't want you to live by it. And he most certainly don't want you to hear it preached. I was, someone was sharing with me that they got an edict the other day from corporate America where one of the corporations are saying um, among the things that you can't talk about while on the job, even if asked, is the, about the Bible and religion and Christianity. Um, one, of the, one of the movements behind this is that Satan knows that when this thing is spoken, it cannot be communicated and be resisted. If it is allowed to be communicated, somebody is going to come to Jesus. They may not come that day. They may not come that hour. But that word is going to germinate in them. Hence the great effort on behalf of the devil to keep God's truth from being heard. Satan doesn't mind preaching. Satan doesn't mind teaching. He just don't want us to preach and teach God's truth. You can preach pop psychology. You can preach and teach. Um, um, black liberation theology. You can preach and teach um, a lot of the thing. A lot of the things that you hear being preached and taught today, and Satan is not moved at all. 
but he doesn't want the Bible to be preached and taught. The Bible says this um, about life. In Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 15, it says, Good understanding giveth favor. That is, discernment brings favor. It, it adds to one's social standing. Amen. Le being learned college students and learning to discern and to develop insight and to be wise in your decision makings adds to your social standing. Good understanding giveth favor. But the way of the transgressor is hard. Treachery, double dealing, being underhanded makes life hard. Word hard here carries the idea of swimming upstream. Some people's whole life is characterized by swimming upstream, bless you Carol, because they won't do right. Just won't. They just got to Always try to bend the rules, always try to be a slickster, um, always trying to take some sort of shortcut, always something, always an angle, a game. People like that, don't, you don't realize that you make your own way hard. This is what the Bible says about life. The Bible removes the gray in life. And the Bible brings clarity to life. It clears up a lot of things. A lot of people are confused because they simply don't know what the Bible says. Amen. They have challenges because they do not understand the scriptures. Let me say this about the Bible. The Bible can be hard-hitting. It can be quite compassionate. But the Bible is always right. The Bible, God's truth, both shows us the way and it reveals what's there. Amen. The lighted path or the light that the Bible gives is not a light. That is whatever we want it to be. The Bible shows us what's there. What's there. The pitfalls that exist. It's not a fairy tale book. Bible will show you that if you persist in certain behavior, if you are determined to live a certain kind of way, the Bible will show you what will undoubtedly happen to you. The Bible doesn't light up the road of life and, all, and just show you that life is a beautiful street. Sometimes it shows you that there are some bad uh, potholes in the road. The Bible will show you where the bridge is out. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. It, it, it shows us What's there? The Bible will reveal whether a relationship is worth your time or not. The Bible. That's the reason the devil don't want you to read it. There's a reason he doesn't want you to live by it. There's a reason he doesn't want you to hear it preached. See, people want to come up with their own philosophies their own definition of how life works. And you can come up with your own, 
but it's pseudo. It's false. It'll never pan out because in the end, God's word is going to speak. And what the Lord says will be, will be. Regardless to whatever philosophy you or I, praise the Lord, come up with or invent or imagine. It doesn't matter. In the end, God's word prevails. As we embrace the Bible's teachings and concepts, we see just how the word of God enables us to navigate this life. The Bible says this, and I want you to turn with me to Psalms 119. And we're going to begin reading uh, at the 105th verse of the 119th Psalm. Psalms 119 and 105 reads as following. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn, and I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me. Notice, the word of the Lord doesn't keep afflictions away. But God knows how to quicken you in the midst. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. Except I beseech thee the free will offerings of my mouth. O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. My soul is continually in my hand. That is, my life is in constant danger. Yet do I not forget thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me. Yet I erred. That is, I wandered not from thy precepts. Thy testimonies have I taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined mine heart, that is, I have resolved my heart to perform, to obey thy statutes always, even unto the end. Notice what he says about the word. He says the word in verse 105 is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I like what William Barclay had to say about this particular passage. David, William said this about the time of David writing. David writing this psalm, he says, we are not to picture a modern electric torch shining its light in a beam ahead in, in the darkness. The lamp in Old Testament in Old Testament times was like a flattened teapot. It carried one small wick which could only flutter in the breeze. As its light fell, only one foot ahead in the darkness. And as the pilgrim took one step forward, so the light moved that much forward with him. So it's not a flashlight in the Old Testament that you could see way down the road. 
but a little lamp that only lit up the way one foot ahead of you. As we moved, the light moved. As they moved, the light moved with them. God's light, Barclay says, does not destroy the darkness. We cannot see into darkness. So we cannot find a final answer to the problem of evil, but the figure here is sufficient for faith. God is with the pilgrim on his way. Exodus uh, 3 and 12 says, God says, certainly I will be with thee. God is with us, and he's never more than one step ahead. His word is a light. Lamp unto my feet and a light to my pathway. Isn't that something? As we move, the light moves with us. Follow me now. The psalmist, uh, he hates every wrong path because if you look at verse 104 he says though my though thy precepts through excuse me thy precepts I get understanding therefore I hate every false way this uh, man who hates every wrong path is thankful for God he He's thankful to God for his word. Verses 106 through 112 that I just read shows that obedience to God's glorious light puts us on such a path that we can overcome any danger and dodge every trap. Thank you, Jesus. And walking in, and we can walk in God's God-given heritage of joy. Righteous judgment is mentioned in verse 106. The word is mentioned in verse 107. Judgments in verse 108. Law in verse 109. Precepts in verse 110. Testimonies in verse 111. Statutes. In verse 112, these are all synonyms for God's truth or God's word. Amen. Verse 105 says, thy word, O God, is a lamp. Whether you call it his judgments, his truth, his testimonies, his precepts, all of these are synonyms. For the Bible. And if we obey it, the Bible takes us through everything. And the Bible gives us joy and keeps us through life's challenges. Even in verse 142 of this psalm, Psalm 19, it says this, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law, the word of God, is the truth. Isn't that good news? Also verse 140 of this same psalm says, Thy word is pure. That is, the Bible has been tried, refined, and tested. Thy word is pure. Therefore thy servant love it. Who here loves the Bible? If you don't, you should. Learn to, for it is the only pure book in existence. It is the only book that has been tested and tried and have uh, come out with complete victory. The Bible is right. You can apply it to every area, and you should, to every area of life. Lastly, in this particular text, uh, verse 103, uh, David says this about God's truth. He says, how sweet are thy words to my taste. You see the exclamation point there. Yea, sweeter 
than honey to my mouth. The Bible is something. I know I said I was going to let Psalms 119 go, but if you look at verse 97 uh, through 100, you you y'all let me read these three. It says, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day long. It is what I muse about. It is what I think about. It is what I go over in my mind. See, be careful with all these video games. All this television. All this time on your uh, smartphones. All the time you spend on Facebook and everywhere else. Learn to invest time in God's word. Learn to read it and think about it. The word selah in the Bible is not to be spoken, but it means think about it. See, some of us read the Bible, but we read to get through. Well, I better read something because the pastor might say something to me if, if I don't. No, you got to read the word to learn what's in it. He said, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou, through thy commandments, hast made me, look at this, wiser than mine enemies. For they are ever with me. The Bible makes you smarter than your enemies who are trying to bring you down. He says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I kept thy precepts. Be careful of some of these so-called community leaders who come to you and try to hijack you with off. Backwards teachings. Don't let nobody sell you on the five percenters. Don't let nobody sell you on these strange doctrines and teachings. Don't let anybody sell you on some ancient Egyptian religion. Why would I serve a God from Egypt when the God of Moses defeated all of the Egyptian gods? See, a lot of times, I'm just going to say this, see, some of these things, the angle on some of these are to try to make your color, your skin color, a religion. Our blackness is not a religion. It, it is not just as the Aryans were wrong to assume that they were superior because they were white. We were wrong to assume that our skin tone is a religion. Some of them are fanning hard. I guess they got hot. Amen. I wonder what, the, you know, back in the day when they didn't have air conditions. And all, I wonder how they make it. Now you, just so much now. Every time you turn around. Oh, my. <laughs> I love you all. I know you love me. I know you're praying for me. Um, but, you know, they, they're always trying to, people are always trying to criticize you. Now, the media whom I loathe more and more. And uh, I speak with a, from a position of strength because I've dealt with the media. I've dealt with the media. One of my friends told me one day, said, we don't see you in the news as much as we used to. What happened? I said, when I began to tape them as they taped me, they stopped interviewing me. But when I would interview them and just let them do the taping, they would take the interview and splice it and make it say whatever they want. Well, we send people to the website and show the whole interview. And so then uh, they said, well, now we can't use him. The media uh, has uh, tried to, during the primaries, suggest that somehow black folk are somewhat behind, that we have not uh, evolved and developed uh, like white people in that we, uh, even black
black Democrats would not vote nor support Buttigieg because he was married to a man and he's an open homosexual. And the black community has not uh, caught up yet and they still uh, have a problem with this. I pray that we, if that's behind, I don't know if I should have used that word. <laughs> if that is our being backwards, then Lord, please leave us backwards. Amen. Amen. They're saying we're backwards because we agree with God on the issue of marriage and human sexuality because we, we're so dumb to believe that a man should marry a woman and that, uh, uh, praise the Lord, that homosexuality is wrong and, and that, you know, it, it shouldn't have anything to do with whether or not you support him. You, you, you have to weigh a person's uh, judgment. See, because... If he believed that that's all right, I don't care how, care how clean cut he may have presented himself trying to look like a, a homosexual virgin, version of Obama. Clean cut, articulate, and married to a man. You ain't clean married to no man. There's nothing clean about that. And thank God for them black folk down in South Carolina. They sent him packing. Them and the party trying to get rid of old Sanders. And so I praise uh, the, my community for being backwards like that. And I know there are white folk who are backwards like that also. But you, I'm talking about the media, the way they, it, it wasn't a compliment to us. You know, he can't, he can't get African-American support because African-Americans uh, uh, have not evolved on the issue of, of homosexuality. I pray that we don't. And those who have, you haven't evolved, you've devolved. You, you've gone backwards. You, you, you've gone down. You've lost your mind. It's, it's a wicked, godless uh, lifestyle. Now, if I could just get us on board with the sanctity of life. Now, we got one. If we could just check this other box. You know, I, I, look, I, I'm going to preach. And I got to go to Asheboro. In a few minutes, Asheville, Asheville, Asheville. But uh, let me um, the 2020 presidential candidate spoke Thursday at a town hall in South Carolina, where he discussed how populations in developed countries have declined and propose funding programs that help women spur economic growth. Now, there's a reason why the population in developed countries have declined. The main reason is because what this candidate is for was killing the population. Uh, and, and it's not the coronavirus. Uh, that, that's a, that is a media-driven story. I'm not saying that it's not real. Uh, and by the way, saints, 
if you have a cold and you know you got a cold and you know you've been coughing and hacking and coughing, and, don't shake people's hand. You know people don't know. Just tell them I got a cold. You know, just, just you know, just fist bump, smile, whatever. S save your neighbor. I'm not going to ask you to shake your neighbor's hand. <laughs> you know, sometimes we get to preaching, grab your neighbor by the hand. Right. Now, folks, look at the neighbor and say, do you have, the, <laughs> do you have coronavirus? <laughs> but the reason I call it, I'm not, the reason I call it a media-driven story, every year in this country, between 20 to 60,000 people die from, from the flu. Every year. And I think uh, so far in Corona, there's been 14 to 16 deaths. And the overwhelming majority of people were elderly and they had underlining conditions. And so this is a, a media driven thing because it's designed, uh, they, they are politicizing a condition. Amen. And we're praying and, and thank God that you came to church. And I'm so glad nobody's sitting up in here with a mask on. Amen. Um, <laughs> but if you're sick, stay home. And uh, and if you you know you you know you know just you know hey. Somebody told me that one day I reached out to a pastor. I don't want to touch you because I've had a bad cold. I said thank you. I don't say come on anyhow. No, thank you. <laughs> this is my tool. I need to. Say amen. But uh, what's killing the population, what's hurting us in developed countries, is what we fight every Saturday and every week in this church, abortion. An audience member attending the town hall asked Joe Biden what he would do to empower women in poor countries to address overpopulation. What would you do to empower women to address overpopulation? And everybody who talks about overpopulation, they never offer themselves up to help fix the problem. Said so we got too many people. I, I'll go. No, no, no. It's all. <laughs> it's always someone else. See, see, it's not. It's, it's overpopulation when it's someone else. It's it's proper population when it's you. The hypocrisy of the argument. So so uh, uh, overpopulation to empower women in poor countries to address overpopulation. Another serious issue uh, is overpopulation, the audience member said. The majority of the world's population growth takes place in the poorest countries in the world, which the countries that are filled with brown and dark skinned people, you have to admit it. Am I right? And I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not giving a dog whistle. I'm talking plain. Have you, have you noticed so many, how many people now can hear dog whistles? It must not be a dog whistle. Because it used to be if it was a dog whistle, only the dog could hear it. Now everything's a dog whistle. So how did human beings develop the ability to hear dog whistles? <laughs> I'm going to preach in a minute, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm headed somewhere. It takes me a minute to get there because I'm slow like that. But I want to take the audience along with me. So these, the purest, poorest countries in the world where women aren't being empowered, what will you do to help empower women in the world's poorest countries? Biden reportedly explained that he strongly opposes the United States contributions. He strongly opposes 
limiting United States contributions to organizations that provide women's health alternatives for choice. So the first place he goes to empowering women is to abortion. Our world is wicked. The first place you go to empowering women in poor countries, the first thing you mention is killing babies. That's how I'm going to empower you. By killing your seed. What kind of power is that? He said, I strongly oppose the limitations on the ability for the United States to contribute to organization in, country, in these countries that, in fact, provide women's health alternatives for choice. Biden said, we should end that limitation. He added, it's called the Mexico Rule. The New Mexico Act, named New Mexico because it was signed into law by President Bush in New Mexico, keeps America from providing, paying for abortions overseas. As soon as Clinton got in, he undid, he did away with the New Mexico City. And uh, when his reign was over, uh, Bush, Signed it back into law. When his reign was over, Obama did away with it. When his reign was over, Trump signed it back into law. It prevents our country from paying for abortions overseas. So this man is campaigning saying, if I get in, I'll overturn it again. And the way we empower women in poor countries. Poor countries. See, the, and, and the thing about it is, when this man stands up and says this, this is an old white man standing up with a mixed audience, mainly black, offering the extermination of people who look like them if they vote for him and the Negroes applaud him. That's heavy. Uh, it ain't heavy that I said it. It's heavy that they did it. I'm just reporting on it. You can go look it up in the news. Google it. I just described to you what I, that, that we are, that we view empowering women. You empower women by killing babies. Now, what does that have to do with that? The Bible says that children are a heritage from the Lord. According to the Bible, you don't empower a woman by killing their children. When Jesus was born, it brought to pass the prophecy that Jeremiah gave. Jeremiah said, there will come a day when Rachel would be weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they were not. When Jesus was born, King Herod, to kill the baby Jesus, killed every child from two years old on down, trying to kill Jesus. And a cry went out throughout all Jerusalem, throughout all Israel. Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they were not. Oh, I hear, I hear my critics, I hear them wouldn't leave religion out of it. 
You always bring religion into it. I don't bring religion into it. I bring God's truth into it. The Bible says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. The word acknowledge means in everything you do, acquire his knowledge. Acquire his position. Find out what God thinks about the thing. How many ways? In all thy ways. That's politics, sports, entertainment, clothing, jobs, who to marry, whether to marry, how, my God, all of it. In everything you do, I feel the Holy Ghost. God says, ask my opinion. Ask me for direction. That's part of the problem right now. We, we, we don't ask God. Most of us, uh, those of us who are in a bad rut, we're in the rut because we ask God after we sought the Lord, after we jumped. Falling, oh God, help me. You should have asked God before you jumped. You seek the Lord before you leap. You seek the Lord before you buy. You seek the Lord before you say, I do. You seek the Lord before you even cast that vote. You seek the Lord. You find out what the issues are. And you find out what the Bible says. You care. Don't you, I, don't you give any credence to any organization. Any. That. Any. That contradicts the Bible. NAACP or any of the rest of them. If they go against God's word, you stand with God's word. Don't go with the Republican. Don't go with the Democrat. Don't go with anybody who goes against the glorious light of God's truth. Now, do you still believe that the Bible simplifies life? Oh, it does. I'm going to preach to you and then and, and, and take my flight because I don't hardly like the way you all are saying amen. I told you in the opening of this message, sometimes the Bible is abrupt. Boom! And sometimes it's compassionate. According to our text, in our text, 1 Peter, excuse me, 2 Peter, chapter 16. Chapter 1, excuse me, verse 16 through 21. I'm so ahead of myself today. Um, before we deal with the text, the 14th verse tells us something in this chapter. He says this. He says, knowing that shortly I must put off my tabernacle. Put off this my tabernacle, even as the Lord Jesus have showed me. The text reveals that Peter knew that for him, death was around the corner. That time was running out. The apostle Peter was martyred at the age of 60. Um, Jesus told him around the age of 21, Jesus said this to Peter in John's gospel, chapter 21 in verse 18. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself. And walked whether thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, signifying how he would die. They would be crucified. And another shall gird thee and carry thee whether thou wouldest not. Peter was around 21. When Jesus, in John 
12 and 18 made this prediction. Um, the apostle Peter, when Jesus first met him, called him, um, according to John's gospel chapter 1 and um, verse 41, Peter was at least, follow me now, 18 years old. How do you know that he was at least 18? For the reason I know is that he was married. And uh, a matter of fact, he was the only disciple of the 12 who was married. And the Jewish male was expected by 18 to have a wife. We know in Matthew's gospel that Peter was married because the Bible speaks of how Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. So that means he was married, right? And so um, the average age of the disciples when they walked with Jesus, believe it or not, they were between 15 and 18 years of age. See, the culture was different then. See, you had, you had to become a man fast. The way the culture is now, at 40, you're not a man. Notice, notice, notice all of the understanding and the consideration that you have to give the average 50-year-old. But by the age of 18, Peter was a married young man. Preach wouldn't. Jewish males, if they did not submit to a rabbi and become his student, were expected to, between 15 and 18, to get a job as an apprentice, either in their father's business or in business for themselves. We know that the disciples were apprentices. They were fishermen. They worked for their day. They had their own business. And Peter was married. So if you put them between 15 and 18. Peter over 18 because he was married. He followed Jesus for three years. The text that I just read from you, to you where Jesus prophesied in John's gospel chapter 21 and verse 18 was after the Lord had been resurrected from the dead. So this is, now this puts Peter around 21. Jesus tells him the day will come that uh, they're going to carry you. And you're going to be crucified when you die. Forty-one years later, Peter writes, knowing that shortly I must put, I must put off this tabernacle. The Lord said, gave him 41 years between the time he told him and the time that it came to pass. What are you going to do with your time? None, none of us know how much time we have. I tell you one thing, Peter made full use of his time, didn't he? Oh my, he hit the ground running. And, and, and notice what he said. He says in uh, uh, verse 15, he says, uh, uh, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, after they kill me, I'm making every effort that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. I'm doing everything I can, even though my time is almost up, to make sure that when I'm gone, you'll remember. Lord have mercy. He's, he's thinking perpetuity. He's saying, I want the ministry to continue. He makes... He's working with diligence that after, even after he's gone, the church will still be strengthened. And he says, I want you to remember these things. 
What things do you want me them to remember, Peter? Peter might have been referring to the gospel of Mark. Theologians know this, that Mark was called Peter's interpreter. That is, the gospel of Mark was based on Peter's account. Praise the Lord. What Peter saw, Jesus do. What Peter heard Jesus do, Peter told Mark. And Mark, based on Peter's eyewitness account, wrote the book of Mark. Peter said, I want you to remember this. And he possibly may have been referencing his own writings. First Peter was already in existence when he wrote, of course, second Peter. And here's the thing, upper room, and those who are streaming, he says, I want you to remember. Oh, listen, this will, this do, this will do us no good if we don't remember it when it, when it, when it matters. You got to remember this stuff. That's why when you come to church, you got to pay attention. Then go home and study it. Because if you forget it and in the time of trouble, it won't profit you any. If you fail to remember the scriptures, in the time of hardship, it won't, it won't help you. You have to remember. You know, most of us, most of us remember what we should forget. And we forget what we should remember. You should always remember what the Bible says. Peter says, I want you to remember this. I want, remember this. I won't be with you always, but remember. I remember the things that Elder Turner has said to me. I Remember the gospel. I remember, I remember. And in times of trouble, that's when you really have to remember. Are you praying for me? And he says in verse 16 in our text, he says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Notice he says here, for we. Here Peter links himself with the other apostles. And he certifies, pay attention to this, that their message is based on their eyewitness experiences. On the experiences that they had with Jesus and on God's attestation of Jesus Christ. He said, what we've been telling you is not a cleverly devised fable. That is, it is not an invented story. The gospel is not a myth. It's not something made up. Praise the Lord. The Bible is not a, a book of fables. And it's certainly a not, it's not fables about false gods. The Bible is real. It's a disgrace that Jesus has to share Christmas with a fable. It's a disgrace that the resurrection has to be shared with a fable, a bunny rabbit. It's a fable. And we speak of the two. Some churches have Easter egg hunts. You mix fables with God's truth. You have a Christmas program and put a big Santa Claus up. Well, what about the Christmas tree? The first Christmas tree was called a chrisman tree. The history of the Christmas tree is that the Christmas tree told the story of Jesus Christ. We just got to go back to putting the right decorations on it. The tree is supposed to tell the story of the life of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank God for silver bells. But it's supposed to tell the story about Jesus Christ. We're mixing fables with God's truth. Peter said, we have not given you cunningly devised fables. We didn't make this thing up. See, it is likely that there were false teachers there who claimed that the message of the incarnation of Christ, Christ coming in the flesh, the resurrection of Christ, God raising Jesus from the dead. The coming kingdom that Christ will bring. There are those who said that the apostles made this up. And that they fabricated the stories. 
and that the whole thing is a made up lie. Peter said, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord. That is the incarnation and the fact that Jesus is coming back and how God raised Jesus from the dead. Peter said, we didn't make this up, but we saw it when it happened. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were there. You know, Peter, James, and John was taken with Jesus in Matthew's gospel chapter 17 on the Mount of Transfiguration. And while they were up there, Jesus transfigured. Right before them, he began to shine like the sun. Matthew chapter 17 verse 1 says, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, uh, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. Oh, he glowed beyond the, the majesty of the sun. The power, the light, the beams of light, the glory that came from him. It was so powerful that the only word that can be used to describe it was the word transfiguration. That means he changed into another form. His glory was released. Lord have mercy. His face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. Even his clothes lit up. His face lit up. My God, he, he fulfilled Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, that says that Jesus is the express image of God the Father. He didn't look like a natural man there. He looked like Jehovah. He shined like the sun. And while shining like that, the Bible says, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Isn't that something? Woo! They showed up and stand there talking with glorified Jesus. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, which he shouldn't have said anything. I don't know how he shaped his lips to say a word. Lord, it is good for us to be here. Some people don't know when it's best to say nothing. Everything don't, des don't, don't deserve a comment. Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou will, let us make here three tabernacles. Thank God that they didn't do that. One for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he yet spake, the Bible says, Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. While Jesus is shining like the sun. Moses and Elijah standing there. And Peter talking too much. A great cloud overshadowed them. And a voice. A voice uh, uh, out, of, out of the cloud. The voice spoke which said. This is my beloved son. Speaking about Jesus. In whom I am well pleased. Then he said, hear ye him. Translated in the modern language, Peter, shut up. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were so afraid. Praise the Lord. And Jesus came and touched them and said, arise, be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man. Elijah was gone. Moses was gone. Save Jesus only. This is the event that Peter is writing about. Said this took place when I was between 18 and 21 years of age. He said, I saw it. We were on the holy mount. And we heard this voice speak. We experienced this. Going by personal experience, 
Do I have anybody here today who have any personal experiences? Can you testify and give an anecdotal testimony of what the Lord have done in your life? I have personal testimonies. I'll tell you right now, he laid his hands on me. Oh, I can tell you, I can take you back to the day and I can take you back to the hour when the Lord touched me with his holy power. I can tell you what he did for me on last week. I have, I have stories to tell. That's one thing I love about being saved. God gives you experiences. You say, well, I ain't never experienced anything. I ain't never felt nothing. He ain't saved you yet. But when you get saved, just know that the Lord will give you personal experiences where you'll be able to tell people, you can't make me doubt it. I know too much about it. I remember in my early walk, there was a man who came to me and said, I'm going to show you a flaw, an error that's in the Bible. And uh, what he was trying to do was to find the scripture where Paul says when he was riding uh, to Damascus and he fell from the horse and how he, he heard a voice and, uh, and how Jesus spoke to him. And one text talks about how Peter, uh, uh, Paul heard a voice and how the disciples heard it, but they saw no man. And how P Paul said, they saw not, they heard not the voice of him that spoke to me. So they, the, the guy was a legend that there is a conflict in the Bible. And I hadn't been saved very long. And I knew while he was standing there trying to find it, and it's just like the Holy Ghost, he didn't let him find it. I can find it and show it to you. It's not a conflict at all. It's just a different way that he worded the same thing. He didn't say that they didn't hear God. He said they didn't hear the voice of him that spoke to him. That was a conversation that the Lord had with Paul and that he didn't have with them. But the, but the light shined from heaven and it knocked Paul off of his horse. But let me tell you what I had concluded uh, even while he was trying to find it. I thought about what the Lord had done for me. I thought about the touch that I had gotten that Sunday morning. I thought about the joy that had flooded my soul. So I said to myself, if he comes up with something, I'll just wait until I can find Elder Turner and talk with him. Because one thing I know, whatever he says, I know that my God is real. For I can feel him down in my soul. I know he's real. Do I have anybody here who knows he's real? You know through personal experience. You know through the Lord laying his hands on you. You felt his touch. If you felt his touch, let me hear you give God praises. In the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Don't you touch him. Don't you touch nobody. But look at your neighbor and say, he laid his hands on me. Oh! He touched me. Peter said, I saw him. I was there. But I thank God that that ain't all he had. Peter said, not only did we not make this up, we didn't make up the incarnation. We didn't make up the stories about the resurrection. Peter said, but we saw him. We were eyewitnesses to his glory. But that ain't all. He goes to the next level. He goes to the written word of God. In verse 19, he says, and we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Look at this. We have a more sure word of prophecy. That is, we have the words of the prophets made more certain. Here he's referencing the Old Testament. Hallelujah. The point that he's making is that the Old Testament was strengthened by what Jesus did. 
and Jesus. Uh, the Old Testament strengthened Jesus. And Jesus added authenticity to the Old Testament because he came and he fulfilled everything that was written because Jesus came. The Bible is reliable. The Old Testament pointed to the Messiah that he would be born of a virgin, that he would live a sinless life, that he would be crucified, and that on the third day that God would raise him from the dead. Hallelujah. The Old Testament prophesied that he would be, he'd be born in Bethlehem. The Old Testament prophesied that he'd be called out of Egypt. The Old Testament prophesied that he would bear our griefs and carry our sorrows. The Old Testament prophesied that there would come one who would be just like Moses, but he would be the Son of God. The Old Testament prophesied and said, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and he shall be called Wonderful, Mighty, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And it said of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Yes! When Jesus was born, he fulfilled all of the promises that was kept. So Jesus added credibility to the Old Testament. The Old Testament pointed at Jesus. So Peter said, we not only have a personal experience, but there's a written word to back us up. I don't just have a testimony, but I've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I have the epistles. I have the revelation. I have the Psalms. I have the Pentateuch. I have the Old and the New Testament. Aren't you glad for God's Word? Aren't you glad that you have that Bible and you have your experience? It'll let you know that if you just stay with God, He will see you through. He will bring you out. And I heard Peter say, you do well if you take heed to it. How many folk want to do well? Who wants to live well? Who wants to eat well? Who wants to feel well? Who wants to be well? Well, you'll do well if you obey the word of God. Lift your hands and tell God, I'm going to obey your holy word. I'm going to do what you said do, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And, and, and I want you to claim your blessing right now and begin to shout, all is well. It shall be well. All is well because I'm going to do what the Lord says. I'm coming out of what he said come out of. I'm giving up what he said give up. I'm throwing off what he said throw off. And I'm letting the Lord lead and guide me. Say yeah! Say yeah! Just begin to shout all is well. All is well! All is well! Woo! Hallelujah! Right here, would, right here would be a good place to tell you. To grab somebody by the hand, but don't grab them. Just look at them and say, you better do it. You better obey God's word. You better obey. You better get it right. You better do it. Do you want to be successful? Do you want to be happy? Do you want to come out on top? Do you want to live? Do you want to be anointed? Do you want to be blessed? Don't listen to that shyster. Don't listen to that liar. Don't listen to that uh, Iman. You better obey the word of God. 
because everything's going down. But the word of God, how should we obey the word? Follow it like a light shining in a dark place. This is a evil world. This is a mean world. But oh, I'm glad that the light of the Lord keeps on shining. We used to sing, Jesus is the light. Light up the world. He's forever shining in my soul. Well, Jesus is still the light. He is the way up. He's the way through. He's the way up. He's the way over. Just live for him. Just obey him. And everything will be all right. If you obey the Lord, God will. I feel my help here. God will. He'll see you through. If you obey the Lord. Somebody shout right now. Oh, I feel somebody trying to resist the Bible, trying to resist God. But don't you resist him? To resist him is to walk in darkness. The world is dark. And the Bible says, this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men chose darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. It's time to come out of the dark. It's time to walk in the light. It's time to enjoy Jesus. It's time to have your power. It's time to show the devil that you can do it because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I'm going to obey the word of God. For he says right here, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. You know what he's doing here? He's going back to the original argument. And that is that we didn't make it up. We didn't make it up. It's not of a private interpretation. That ain't where we got it from. This ain't Santa Claus. This ain't the Easter Bunny. This ain't Halloween. This ain't Kwanzaa. It ain't some made up thing. But this is real. It's real. Where did you get it from? Holy man. They wrote as they was moved by the Holy Ghost. That Bible is the word of God. It'll heal you. It will deliver you. It will set you free. You just got to follow. You got to tell the Lord where you lead. I will follow. I'll go with you all the way, all the way. Hello. Woo. Somebody praise the Lord right now for his glorious word. Woo. In this world, with all that's going on, there's a way through. There's a remedy. There's a solution. There's a way out. It's God's word. It's God's word. It's God's word. If you're not living the Bible, you're walking in darkness. If you operate in agreements that, that, that contradict the Bible, you're walking in darkness. If you've decided that you're just not going to obey him and you're going to do your own thing, you're walking in darkness. And you will lose. You will lose. Even if you don't lose until you die, you're going to lose. Even if it works until you breathe your last breath, 
Remember, the other side is forever. This side is temporary. The other side is forever. Any way you look at it. This light, thank God that the light that Peter speaks to is a much stronger light than what David spoke to in Psalm 105 because what Peter spe is speaking of now is a torch. It's a torch light. They didn't have them torches when David wrote that, but it's a torch light. And when you turn that torch on and you push that torch out there, it lights up the world. It lights up the land. It lights up the terrain. Oh, there's a 50-foot drop there. I didn't see it, but the light showed it to me. Let, let me go this way. Oh my God, there's a snake over there. I, I, I wouldn't have, I would have walked, I would have walked up on it, but the light lit it up. Woo! A torch lit path. Hallelujah. It's all kinds of pitfalls, but the Bible shows you the way. If you follow it, if you obey it, it's the key to getting through all of life's obstacles. School, life, marriage, sickness, pain, death, sorrow, there's a life. And we got to promote the light. Amen. Tell the people about the light. Thank you, Sister William, for preaching the light. Let the light shine around the world. Glory to God. I'm glad that I have this light. I'm glad. I wonder where I would be had I not saw the light. What would have became of me? What would I have done had I not followed the light? Glory to God. Now I tell you, my mind is made up. To just follow this light. How many got your mind made up today? I'm following this light. Woo! The altar is open. Pray for me, Pastor. I want to follow the light. The world is, is all kinds of questions. All kinds of things. I need the Lord to lead and guide me. To help me navigate and get, get a grip on life. See, I open with the way of the transgressor being hard, always swimming upstream. God don't want you always swimming upstream. It's his will. It's his will to cause your life to flow like a mighty river <laughs> downstream with the momentum if I'm talking to you, come quickly. Come quickly. Hold up the light. Hold up the light. Hold up the light. All oh, you heaven bound soldiers. Hold up the light. Mm -hmm. Hold up the light uh, Let the light shine around the world Hold up the light Hold up the light Hold up the light All oh, you heaven Bound soldiers, hold up. 
up the line. Will there be another before we begin to pray? Thank you, Jesus. Will there be another? Father, in the name of Jesus, your word, oh God, your glorious word, this word that has not been fabricated, it's not a myth, it's not what I think he's MSNBC news reporter Chuck Todd said he called the story of the whale Jonah being swallowed by a whale he called it a fairy tale. Jesus referenced Jonah. Jesus endorsed that story. And Jesus is Lord. I take Jesus' word over Chuck Todd's word any day. That's why I don't watch them shows. I don't know why you get your news from anybody who, who would tell you that they believe the Bible is a, a fairy tale. There you sitting there watching it. Something wrong with you. Father, I'm trying to pray. Father, 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 we come before you right now. In the name of Jesus. Your word is right. And your word is, is the solution. To everything that we face, your word, oh God, your word, your word, the words in your word, the stories that are contained in your word is right and are true and holy. And then God, our personal testimony, you touched us. Somebody on this altar needs another touch from your Lord. In the name of Jesus. Father, we ask that you would do it. We ask that you would do it for your glory. And do it for your honor. In the name of Jesus. We rebuke the devil right now. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you right now. This is not made up. This is the word of God. The Bible is not some myth. It's the word of God. And we stand on God's holy word in the name of Jesus we stand on God's holy word in the name of Jesus we stand on God's holy word in the name of Jesus they can call us what they want to they can label us but we stand on God's holy word in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, break every yoke. Oh, God. Oh, God. You know what is needed. You know what each person has come for. God, do it on this altar. In the name of Jesus, restore the backslider. Strengthen the weak. Heal the sick. Strengthen the feeble-minded in the name of Jesus. Strengthen the feeble need. God, meet every need. God, give us to be steadfast. Steadfast. Steadfast in Jesus. In your name we pray. In the name of Jesus, thank God. Amen. And amen. Would you give the Lord praises? <clears throat> Hallelujah.